Welcome to the Unapologetic Heroine Podcast, where myth is made manifest. As the author of The Way of Inanna, A Heroine's Guide to Living Unapologetically, this podcast is based on Inanna, the Sumerian goddess of love and war who embodies multidimensionality and lives unapologetically true to her heart. We showcase the wisdom of individuals courageous enough to do the same. These are inspiring stories of what it takes to be authentically who you are. My guests honor the wisdom of love, embrace the polarities of being human, and walk their truth. I am your host, Shauna Zalazo, licensed psychotherapist, intuitive channel, and author of the book, The Way of Inanna. Thank you so much for tuning in. Hello and welcome. I am really looking forward to this show today and the opportunity to meet with two inspiring women who, like the goddess Inanna, stand solidly in their warrior power. Cornelia Holden and Cami Craig run Mindful Warrior, a globally recognized performance coaching and culture design company. Attempting to compress the incredible accomplishments and wealth of experience these two have into one show will be challenging, but here goes my attempt. In the mythology of Inanna, the goddess's descent into the underworld is a call to spirit, catapulting Inanna into a healing process and initiation that ultimately empowers her. As performance coaches at Mindful Warrior, both Cornelia and Cami have spent years mastering the initiation process. They teach high performers and visionaries how to unapologetically own their authority and greatness by aligning with flow. For almost two decades, the founder and CEO of Mindful Warrior, Cornelia Holden, has been supporting leaders and forward thinkers to develop the mindset and behaviors necessary to affect exponential cultural transformation. She has worked with Olympic and U.S. national teams, globally renowned educational institutions, national not-for-profits, and top 10 tech and private wealth management firms. She worked with the U.S. women's national hockey team the year they achieved their first ever number one ranking. With a master's in divinity from Harvard and a background as an elite ski racer who won an NCAA Division II title, Cornelia knows a thing or two about what it takes to be at the top and perform to your potential. After sustaining a serious head injury in a skiing accident at 21, Cornelia dedicated herself to understanding the nervous system and learning how to heal herself. This journey ignited her desire to integrate the knowledge she amassed and the multivalent aspects of her personality to create a model of performance and excellence that incorporates mindfulness, elite athletic training, cutting edge coaching techniques, neuroscience, and wisdom traditions geared to developing emotional spiritual intelligence. Cornelia's business teammate and collaborator, Cami Craig, is all too familiar with deep dives into mastery, both literally and figuratively. She is an Olympic silver medalist and two-time Olympic gold medalist in water polo. Tammy is a three-time world champion and is considered the greatest water polo player of all time. She co-founded the not-for-profit Camps for Champs to empower and inspire young women through the sport of water polo and has also mentored hundreds of young athletes. She's also an inspiring public speaker and voice of the awesome Mindful Warrior Radio podcast where she showcases brave and authentic stories with very practical implications for listeners. I'm a huge fan of her podcast and admire Cami's thoughtful questions and the apparent ease with which she draws out the heart-centered wisdom of her guests. I wanted to have both Cornelia and Cami on together, not simply because they are exceptional examples of what it looks like to shine at full wattage, but also because of the focus on collaboration that is intrinsic to the Mindful Warrior model. This collaboration, the idea of us all being teammates on the planet, is a meaningful reframing, a shift out of separation consciousness into unity. It's a message consistent with Inanna's role as the goddess of love. As you can hear, these two brilliant women unapologetically own their greatness and guide others to do the same. Welcome, Cornelia and Cami. Thank you. Thank you, Shauna. What an introduction. Beautiful. Wow. Is it okay to start with crying on your podcast? (laughs) (laughs) Absolutely. Oh, that was so beautiful. Let's just leave it there. (laughs) (laughs) Absolutely. (laughs) 
Throughout my research on Inanna, who is the goddess of both love and war, I have given a lot of thought to the meaning of the term warrior. I have come to understand that Inanna's dual role emphasizes the integration of our polarities, the reconciling of our shadow aspects, and the significant inner work required for this. I also came to see that there is a fierceness that is needed to dismantle old paradigms and establish new ones. So Inanna's warrior nature is used to slay separation consciousness and lay down the foundation to build a new reality based on love. This is the work of a warrior. Cornelia, I wondered if we could start by exploring your interpretation of what it means to be a warrior. Wow. Whew. Well, Shauna, what an incredible opportunity and privilege to just be with you and Cami today, two of my favorite warrior women. So, you know, I guess for me, I love that definition that you just provided about Inanna. And I think my whole life has been... um trying to pursue all the um, multi-dimensional and complex ways of showing up in the world. And somehow that for me feels like warriorship, at least how I've, I've chosen to embody it. And I remember one of my beloved teachers, Angelus Arian, once saying to me that the archetype of the warrior in its simplest form means to show up. And when I came up with the name of our company, I added the word mindful before it simply because we live and have always lived in a in a moment when we can show up either skillfully or unskillfully in so many different ways. And so I think the way I would say it is that warriors show up skillfully and that skillfully part is both art and science and is really why we do so much coaching work to invite the fullness of who we are online and then to do the ref- the training work necessary to refine that kind of skillfulness so we can show up with all of ourselves, but not sort of like a bull in a china shop, right? It's like you mm. show up um, with all of yourself, but not in a way that damages always. Obviously, you just said that Inanna recognizes that there's a fierceness to that warriorship. So sometimes there's a need to break, but there is certainly in a warrior, a deep need to bridge. And I think we're living in a moment where bridging is probably one of the highest and most essential art forms. Mm, I love that so much. Thank you so much about that bridge is so that idea of the bridge is so significant. And both you and Cami are showing up in the world as bridges for others to step into their warrior nature. Cami, I was wondering how one recognizes a mindful warrior. Is it something someone either has access to or not? Or is the warrior spirit within all of us waiting, like the gift of intuition to be recognized and further honed? Yeah, what a wonderful question. And I think just what comes up immediately is it's an, I think it's an earned practice, right? It's something that happens and can be cultivated over time, uh, based on your environment and experiences and how you're to what Cornelia was saying and how you're showing up, because I believe it being a warrior is not a reckless act, right? It's not again, just about breaking and only that fierceness and that fire. Cause it's met with um, strategy and skill and a lot of love as well. Um, a warrior in my mind is truly a, a balanced being that has the ability to kind of read and attune to what's going on around them. When I think about a warrior, typically I feel like it's a part of an army, right? Um, it's a part of a tribe. It's a part of a group. Um, and so there is a an ability to have that kind of awareness of self and others and the the whole. Um, and so I think that it's it's earned. I think that there, I think you can be born with a warrior spirit spirit, but also I think you still have to go through the process of kind of earning that embodiment of what a, a true warrior is. Oh, I love that answer. It gives me chills. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Embodying it. Absolutely. And that that perspective of earning it, um, certainly as athletes, both of you know uh, a lived experiential um, 
aspect of that. You both have walked through that, earning it for sure. Um, and you both have such a profound understanding of the concept of flow and in fact, teach others how to achieve the flow state. I'm so intrigued by your individual experience with flow and would love to hear from both of you on this. Cornelia, let's start with you. Can you explain what flow is to you and share with us why the concept of flow is an important focal point, both in your life and in your work? Well, um, I'll start just with Mihaly Csikszentmihalyi, who, who coined that term. He's a psychologist who passed actually during um, COVID, and he mm -hmm. defines flow as um, a wonderful integration and intersection and balance of having the right skill set for a specific challenge. And he talks about how flow is something that you're out of when either the challenge is so great that your skill set is, you know, not not sizable or or the right one for whatever you're facing, which I think in a lot of ways is kind of what a, a lot of people are are feeling in the world today, whether it's with COVID or with um, political divisions or just financial markets or whatever it is. Um, the, when the challenge really exceeds your sense of your abilities, you are in anxiety. And um, and that's a tough place to be in. And then he talks about how you can also pop out of the flow zone when um, your skills are so great, like you've trained and you've honed and you've been initiated like you talked about. And for some reason, uh, what's showing up in your life is just kind of below the the challenges you need to bring forth the skills that you've developed. And so he talks about how in that space, you, you drop into boredom. So boredom and anxiety and his initial model are the two kind of areas outside of the flow zone. And beyond that, for me, um, I think it's important just to recognize, I mean, I'm a huge believer in just honoring, you know, where, where these ideas come from. And I would say even behind Shiks Mahai, uh, cultures for thousands and thousands of years have understood these ideas. I think Shiks Mahai was the first, you know, white Western male to to define it this way. And for me, I think I'm I'm sort of picking up both threads. I'm picking up kind of traditional um, peoples and traditional cultural understandings uh, of flow, and I'm picking up some of Shiks Mahai's work. I'm picking up some of my great grandfather's work. Um, he coined the term. Uh, homeostasis and really was instrumental in discovering the fight or flight response. And so here I am, um, a ski racer and broke through one cold February day um, on Wildcat Mountain in, in New Hampshire and just was in this kind of one plus minute flow state experience. So ski races are quite short. And I, to this day, I've had other flow experiences, but nothing quite like that moment when mind, body and spirit were so aligned. The, I guess the way I would describe it is when you're a spinning top and everything is organized in a balanced, high intensity, high performance spin around a central axis and you can move fluidly. And that's something obviously that's pretty extraordinary to do when you're going down a mountain and you're in multiplanar movement and it's icy and there's a lot going on. Um, but when there's that kind of alignment, it's a profound experience. And so, um, you know, there you you can certainly do it in skiing. You can do it in water polo as, as Cami's experienced. I'm, I know, Shawna, you've experienced it in running. And also you can experience it um, on, a, on a walk or with a dog or a child or when you're knitting or doing a hobby or something like that. When mind, body and spirit drop in and are fully integrated and back to your intro, all those dualities, good, bad, either or black, white, better, less than, all of them fall away and you just are basically everything all at once, which also is all kind of an experience of nothingness. And so it's both and nothing and everything all at once in the isness of the now. And it was described when Mah Mahali Shiks Mahai interviewed a lot of people, it was described by people as just one of the most healthy experiences of well-being that they'd ever had. So that's kind of flow in a nutshell for me. 
Mm, I think that is so profound. And the idea of it being an experience of well-being, that it that it's that it is something that we have access to, that we we can all <laughs> have, uh, enter, right? Um, this is such a, a beautiful uh description of flow, Cornelia. Thank you. And Cami, what about you? Have you experienced flow both in and out of the water? Yes. And I think what's really coming up for me right now is this idea of um, experience collective flow, right? So Cornelia shared it from the place of being, you know, an individual athlete and you've experienced it that way as a runner, but what does it mean to get seven girls in the pool at once and have them all connect and find collective flow to rise above? Um, And, you know, what is the difference between that you know, having the collective flow of seven versus like a moment of connection and flow with one specific teammate or you and yourself in flow with the movement, you know, or the craft that you are doing. Um, but I recently had Adam Krikorian, the women's U S national team head coach on mindful warrior radio. And one of the elements that he chose to lift up in regards to team connection was love. Um, and I think that when I think about collective flow and what is it to come together as a team, there has to be safety. There has to be trust. There has to be an element of love and there has to be, um, a type of standard or, um, kind of mark that we're all knowing that we're, we're holding together, um, to experience flow, collective flow as a group. Um, and just the challenges it is to not only one, make sure that you come correct to competition, right. Or even practice to hopefully access flow, but what is it to actually get seven people on the same page? And what does that feel like? Um, and I've had the honor of competing in the finals of the Olympic games in front of 15,000 fans. And really all I'm seeing is the teammates moving around me and not even seeing, but actually feeling my teammates, knowing where they are, the timing, um, what the connection is going to feel like. And almost it's kind of this intuitive feeling of like knowing when to expect that person coming around. There's a total flow within the game. And it's almost as if your teammates fall or fold into that flow. And so there's just this kind of expectation is the word I'm using, but that's just this kind of intuitive knowing um, that your teammates going to, uh, you know, step in or flow into this space and you just keep kind of doing this dance together. Um, But it's a dance of kind of, you know, force and like surrender, um, or pushing together. Like there's a, there's a bit of, um, how do I describe it? Like a resistance to then letting go and then a resistance to letting go, right. You can't just simply be relaxed when you're competing. So there has to be this kind of ebb and flow. And when you can do that together, some pretty magical things can happen and it can be seen by, you know, those on the pool deck or even in the stands and, that to me is probably one of the most, (laughs) like one of the best feelings ever. One of the most energizing feelings is when you can experience this collective flow, even outside of yourself. Wow. You know, I hadn't, I have never experienced it in the way that you're describing it. And as you're describing it, Cami, I'm pulled into that collective, (laughs) that collective Mm -hmm. experience of it. So I so appreciate how flow, I appreciate the multidimensionality of flow. Um, and I also so appreciate the notion that it really all always comes back to love, (laughs) that that's such a principle, a central principle. Thank you both for that. And I, I am certain that it, that it speaks to the hearts of our listeners. Cornelia, in your two decades of doing this work, what stands out as the most important principle in helping individuals access their greatness? I think I'm still figuring that out, Shauna, but it's interesting as Cami and I work together to build our content and teach and so forth. One of the things that we've been talking a lot about recently is um, the difference between empathy and compassion. And we've been really focusing on the role of compassion in um, mental health and in teamwork and in building healthy cultures. 
And one of the things we get hired to do in the corporate sector um, is help teams and companies move what from what we would call like a low trust, lower performance um, culture to a higher trust, higher performance culture. And um, we also think a lot about our work through the lens of neuroscience, which you mentioned earlier. And, you know, really a, what the, the sort of primary default of, of the way our nervous systems evolve is um, the default to fear, um, which then couples with doubt and anxiety and all of those kind of below the line, not so happy or um, healthy, if you stay stuck in them, not so healthy uh, emotions. And so um, as we've been working together and thinking about um, how to teach and how to help people grow in health and grow together, as Kami said, um, into teams of health too, We've really been focusing on what happens when compassion is the bedrock of a culture versus uh, competition solely, and nothing wrong with competition, but when it's solely comp competition and fear or judgment, fear and competition. Um, it's the, I think the best way I would say it, Shauna, is that I've been really, I really, we think a lot about culture, like we think about, or uh, like we think about gardening or the way I think about it is through gar the lens of gardening, which is when the soil is arid or dry or without enough uh, proper nutrients, it's hard for things to grow. And where I've come to at this point is whether it's your child is playing on, you know, the local hockey or baseball team, or you're um, in a marriage or a partnership, or you're part of a, a company, um, there's a very different feeling about how you can grow when the soil of that relationship is based in uh, compassion, which is closely aligned with love, um, but slightly different in that it's, um, I love the definition of compassion, that it's empathy with skillful action. So it's about coming alongside somebody with that kind of em empathic care, which of course has to be tethered to love. And then also taking it beyond just that empathic connection of coming alongside someone to also collaboratively work toward an effective and skillful solution so that you don't get stuck in kind of that eddy of empathy where you can't really get anything. You don't feel any momentum. You can't, you, you can't kind of get moving forward. And so yeah, I think at this point in my career, we'll see what happens in tomorrow or a, 10 years from now. But I'd say cultivating a, a compassionate inner coach and building cultures where compassion is um, is actually alive and well, especially when you're under pressure, is um, a very, very high performance, high trust state. Oh, absolutely. That the idea of compassion uh, and cultivating compassion and uh, making that distinction with love is so powerful. And, and, and Cami, when you were describing what it takes for the seven women in the pool to show up uh, to access flow state, I kept thinking about compassion for each other, for what we're all feeling. And so I'm so grateful for that, um, for that, uh, Cornelia, because it really, it really highlights such a powerful concept that the work you're doing, both of you as mindful warriors yourselves, <laughs> is definitely cultivating compassion uh, in, within the collective. So mm -hmm. thank you so much. Um, and, you know, I was thinking quite a lot about the the ways in which Inanna is embodied. She's she's a goddess who continuously highlights her connection to her own physicality and her strength. And for me, this insistence highlights that on the physical plane, the body is a portal to our own divinity, our goddess nature. Indeed, Inanna's focus on the body urges us to celebrate this holy vehicle of ours and to use it with intention to take us into mastery. As elite athletes yourselves, you have both intentionally engaged with the body and certainly celebrated what it can do. Cami, is the body a bridge to emotional, spiritual intelligence for you? Yeah, I think... I think, how could it not be, you know, um, I think that, oh man, it's interesting to think about, I, I mean, I boil down to like, even what is just the relationship I have to my body and, and how it has, uh, you know, changed over time. But this idea of, you know, the appreciation, the love, the, 
you know, even looking at what my body has been able to do for me in this life, I have almost been in awe of, Mm -hmm. um, in regards to the level of training and competition and, um, you know, what it has, it's been this, um, it's given me this ride. Right. And so when you ask me if it's connected to spirituality and things along those lines is yes, because it's been the vessel for it at times. And it's, it's allowed me to experience collective flow in a way that probably I wouldn't, wouldn't have been able to experience out of a team setting where, you know, we are competing at a high level and you're kind of in this, um, it's almost like a, you know, you're in that flow or that vibration. It's, I've been able to access different things. I've been able to access intuition through what my body's been able to do, you know, and, and the repetitions that it's built in the pool and how it's shown up in elite athletics. And, um, I think, yeah, I think the, as I'm processing this lifetime with you, I think the, the biggest thing I can point out is that the body has it has yes, very much been this vessel and this gift to kind of flow through these different experiences and earn different skill sets to allow me to kind of fill or access different parts of who I am as a whole. What I love about that is the capacity to reframe or or develop a, a, an empowered relationship with our body. This is such an mm-hmm. important message for all of us, especially for women in in this current paradigm. Um, so I appreciate that. Um, and, and the idea of it being the, almost like the vehicle that has helped you understand deeper aspects of yourself. Um, yeah, it's available to us all. (laughs) Mm. Um, absolutely. And Cornelia in how did your background as an elite ski racer equip you with the ability to develop and run a company to guide individuals to actualize at the highest level? Ah, that's a great question. Um, Well, the first thing that comes to mind is um, just the the discipline and organization it takes to pursue something to like a mastery level. So I think about, um, I remember I had a client one time just talking with me about something she wanted to accomplish. And I said, oh, you know what? I just bought like a I don't know whether it was a three, I think it was a three year calendar at Staples. And I popped out and grabbed it and brought it into, to my office and showed her this calendar that was kind of like, here's, here's the plan. And here's the big picture. And here's what I'm, and she was like, Oh my Lord, like what? I'm like, Oh, don't you do this? Like, this is what you do. Like you have to have a three year plan and you have to have this vision and you have to then, you know, hold the vision, but then decide where and when you need to peak and what you need to do, you know, daily and then weekly and monthly. And, um, and then obviously even with a plan, you have to know how to pivot because things happen. You get injured or you get better than you thought quicker than you thought, or you learn a new skill or you meet somebody or you, a coach falls away or you gain a new coach or teammate or whatever it is. So I think one of the things that, um, looking back helped me is being, I I would say, holding a vision and a dream for an extended period of time, despite naysayers or despite your own naysaying or doubts, you know, being able to, uh, as they say in Buddhism, hold the view. So you, you being able to hold a view for a long period of time, I would say is exactly what I've had to do in the couple decades I've been running Mindful Warrior. And then um, that's obviously not enough because then you've got to execute on the view, um, or at least come up with your best guess about how you might enact the view. And then, um, I'd say from there, you also have to develop skills, uh, around pivoting. So there's this, like, I think of it like a symphony where everything's structured and you got to get the structure, but then the reality is never as structured as what you plan. So then you got to be able to jazz improv. Um, which is, you know, just how to pivot and move and take advantage of things. Um, that opportunities that come your way or, or meet challenges that you you couldn't have foreseen and, and, and choose to orient to them as though they're just part of the, you know, the journey and the training program, and you're going to get better no matter how you, you know, if you face them well. Um, And then, you know, I'm thinking about the question you asked Cammie just about spirituality, because that has actually been a huge piece 
uh, for me as a, as a CEO and the way I would, I mean, there's, there's sort of a lot to say there, but the way it's, I think impacted how I lead and build a company has to do a little bit too with the way I pay attention and orient to grace and mystery and even risk and opportunities and trusting that, um, you know, for example, uh, when I hire people and then they need to, you know, leave because let's say they're something else has come up in their life, a different opportunity, or they meet somebody and they need to move to be with that person. So not, um, of course, I'm very human and my feathers get ruffled and it's hard when things change that you don't expect, but there's a way in which trust in a generative world order has been probably really helpful for me in navigating and weathering um, the grit that's you know, necessary to keep getting back up on the horse after things change and pivot and you go through hard times. But it's also like, you know, Cammy's here with me now. And I think about doing this for two decades and I only met her a couple of years ago. And then we started working officially together a year and a half ago. And just the patience, I think, to wait for a true teammate has been part of my own I think that's part of my athleticism and part of my spirituality and just that kind of willingness to um, retain hope and vision, even as what you want as the end goal has not arrived yet and keep maintaining faith and then, and then, and keep going out and seeking opportunities and then trusting that they'll come and then doing something about it. (laughs) Like when I met Cammy, man, did I do something about it? I was like, girl, (laughs) we are going to do something cool together. So, you know, I think all of those things um, are part of the journey of being um, a leader and a a businesswoman. Mm, Absolutely. And that idea of holding a vision and a dream that you're describing, and I can really uh, connect with that as an athlete. And it's just that that vision and dream is out there. And, you know, you you mentioning the three-year calendar makes me laugh because I get it. (laughs) This idea of periodization and training um, with this long-term goal and um, really beautiful. Thank you. (laughs) Uh, Cami, as a water polo player, your sport is played both in and out of the water. Symbolically, I find this very significant. It's an enactment of balance uh, of the masculine and feminine aspects of self, of the mind, body, of the individual and the collective. To what extent was your sport a training program that allowed you to integrate and reconcile your polarities? Hmm. What an interesting, uh, that's an interesting question. I think, you know, I just was at a seminar yesterday talking about mental health within athletes and just the qualities that training at such a high intensity level, what it allows you to be kind of off the charts at, right? Like the ability to be disciplined, to be gritty, to be patient in the boredom of repping out the same skill set over and over again, um, to, you know, learn how to work with different personalities and different individuals and figure out how to integrate and become a team. And what does it take to, to manage and connect to different personalities in a way that brings success to the entire team. Um, And then there's a challenge of, you know, you're talking about this masculine energy um, and there's a kind of a hardening that happens when you are training at such a, a high level, right? There's not like a true place to fully open and kind of unravel. You can open and let go to the point where you can experience flow and have that dance in the water, you know, as you compete and move through the game. But there's also this kind of armor you continue to wear as you're, you're going out into the water, as you know, you're competing, it's, it's, you're getting after it. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and so there's not really that opportunity to fully kind of open and, um, experience kind of that pause rest and recovery in a whole way. And I think when I look back to how I experienced training at that level and how I would 
do it differently, there would be an adjustment there in regards to the pause, rest, and recovery, and the ability to soften at times so that I could come back together and put on the armor and be more present and whole in the competition and the training that I was moving forward with. And so I think, you know, there's definitely, I think the masculine energy was very, very intact in my time of training as an elite athlete and the feminine really danced around the outer edges and was invited in only when needed. Um, and it's so, it's been such a, uh, it's been such a treat and a wonderful journey to, really allow that balance to come into play post my athletic career, um, to be very familiar with the masculine energy, but also really allow the feminine energy to match that, um, and allow myself to really soften in areas and unravel so that there is access to rest recovery and healing. Um, and so I think that I, what I gained from that period in my life has just showed up tenfold in, in today in in my present moment in, um, how I'm balancing both that masculine and feminine energy and how I can, and how I think that balance is very much in line with what, you know, I'm defining as a warrior as well. Um, so yeah. Mm, that is that idea of of the the masculine aspect of ourselves being really reinforced in in athletics is is something i totally get <laughs> um and then you know as you were describing the feminine sort of dancing around the outsides of that i i really see that as uh i can see it i can see it in the pool <laughs> you know i can see it as you're describing it and it's a beautiful message to uh, convey to us today to begin to open to that softness that you're describing, um, just even from a collective perspective that what the world needs a little right now or a lot of right now is some of that embrace, that softness. Um, and so I it just, it's a beautiful description. Thank you so much. Um, and Cornelia, sort of dovetailing off that topic of water, the pool she was just talking about, um, Mindful warrior is predicated on two core ideas, water as teacher and consciousness is awareness. Those phrases are loaded with brilliance. Can you explain what you mean by those ideas and how they undergird the mindful warrior model? Oh my Lord. Okay. So we got one minute for this answer. I'm going to do my best. <laughs> uh, all right. Water as teacher. I think, um, Two things come to mind right off the bat. Um, one is the fact that I was a raft guide. And um, one, when, and I, let's put it this way I was super terrified of flying when I was little. And um, it was just like the takeoff and the landing, and like, how the heck is this huge beast of a plane up in the air? Like, how does it really work? And how does it stay aloft? And um, so, cut to, uh, a couple summers during college, I, I became a raft guide out on the Colorado River in Colorado. On the, I was on the Arkansas and the Colorado and the Eagle Rivers. And um, to become a raft guide, you have to learn how to read rivers. And then part of the training is you get into rivers and you learn how to self-arrest and you learn how to rescue other people and you learn what an eddy is and you learn what flow is and you learn how to move um, in and out of the flow of a river so that you can navigate it safely uh, yourself and then with your clients. And so as I learned how to read a river and see the way the water could move, but then when it would hit a rock, it would create a gap behind the rock. And so then the water would, would have to backfill in there. And so water runs both upstream and downstream in rivers. And then I learned about pour overs and I learned, um, why you needed to cross eddy lines at certain angles and why you needed to punch through them to get through them to get back into the river safely. And I remember one day as I was doing all of this training, um, and I, I can't remember exactly where it was or whether it, it probably happened multiple times, but you know, when you hike in the mountains and you can see clouds kind of moving up and over mountains and you can see all of a sudden the way um, clouds help you understand it sort of how air is much like water 
but in the sky and the mountains are then like the rocks that are in the river. And I started to suddenly realize what an updraft was and how planes use air like boats use water. And that all kind of blew me away. I think it allowed me in a funny way to let go some because I understood some of the principles of how water and air function, which might sound sort of abstract and out there, but it also felt like really practical. Suddenly I was a little bit less terrified of flying and I was more capable of bringing people down safely. And I think the combination of realizing how everything moves like water and that we are, you know, 80 to 85% water and that there's this tug and pull between women's bodies in particular, though I think probably one day we'll discover that men's bodies are the same, that there's this relationship between women's bodies and the moon and the moon and the tides. And I just, it just allowed me to feel awe and wonder and also like intimacy and deep connection to this planet and my own body and my own self. So that's one aspect of it. I think another aspect was um, I loved, um, I was, I, I was an, um, I took a lot of art history classes in college and I loved Eastern East Asian art. And I loved um, Chinese art in particular, where you could see the creeks and the, and the way that, um, that connected to a lot of Taoist, uh, poetry and writing and this idea that rivers, uh, can cut rock, you know, even though water is so, can be so gentle, it can also be so fierce. And, um, but it's also very patient because water doesn't need to cut a Canyon overnight and it can't. And, um, so I, I guess if we come all the way full circle back to Inanna and we think about like, you know, love and compassion, I think compassion is much like water. It's, it's can be very, very gentle and soothing and healing, and it can actually be profoundly destructive and rageful and aggressive, um, in a, in a class five river, for example. So there's just a lot for me that water feels like an invitation into how the universe works, which I love those kinds of like, wait, how does this all, how does this work? How does this, how are we here? Um, but it also feels like really relevant to just our very day-to-day -day lives. Um, we need it to, to stay hydrated as athletes. And, um, but it's also teaches us about patience and endurance and softness and toughness. And I think about, you know, maybe this, this idea that really the goddess Inanna is inviting us into all of these different ways of being and water has so many ways of being. Um, and for me, that's, that's, that's uh, water's teacher. And um, because I've taken far more than a minute on that first one, I'll just say that awareness, consciousness and, and consciousness as awareness is, is like in many ways, the same as water, that consciousness is like the water in which we as conscious breathing beings um, function. And so that's how consciousness is awareness and awareness is consciousness is also a deep understanding of both our embodiment and our relationality as beings. Oh, Cornelia, thank you so much for that. That's so poignant. And as a surfer, I can, can I, I literally mm. connect with you. Oh, <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> I connect with that. Every single time I paddle out, I am I see water as teacher <laughs> mm. in the biggest way. Thank you so much for that. And as we come to a close, I have one more question. <laughs> Cami, have you noticed patterns emerge around how specifically high performing individuals relate to challenge or what I would call initiation when they confront it. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's really interesting. Cause I think when I think about elite performers and challenge, it's almost, a, this is a strong word, but it's almost like an addiction, right? There's this desire to meet the challenge over and over again. And this desire to one, either meet it and beat it. Um, but two, there's, there's a, uh, almost in my, per, in my experience, like this, 
excitement of if you didn't meet the challenge and you've got the feedback or you've learned the lessons of how to approach it again, um, that's where kind of the true excitement is. It's like, okay, it's time to go back into the lab um, and figure out how to master the skill or adjust the skill or pivot the skill so that you can go after it again. Um, and I think, you know, true warriors and elite performers really can be energized by a challenge, right? Um, because they have put into practice and they've done the preparation and the skill sets are well developed um, to the point where it's like, okay, it's time to see how it how it lands or how what I've invested into shows up within this challenge. And so I think, you know, the pattern is, is that there's an energy and excitement that comes with that. Um, and there is almost, um, a humility and a pride that comes with it. Um, and noticing how you need to step into that challenge with any of those skills. And so I think that, you know, there's a, there's definitely an energy behind that and a willingness to continue to show up again and again and see how you can make those micro um, or macro adjustments in whatever it is that you, um, whatever your skill may be on your way to mastery. Mm, I love that idea of, of bringing forward the humility and the pride at the same time. Mm -hmm. That is such great insight. Thank you. I, I knew that being able to connect with you both would highlight how collaboration is the key to dissolving the separation, the notion of separation and remembering that even in actualizing our greatness, our journey to mastery, we do not have to do it alone. We can link arm in arm with one another and rise together as one. Thank you for being such inspiring and courageous role models of what it means to own our power and stand in our glory as unapologetic heroines of our own life. Please tell us where we can find you, work with you, and experience your teachings. And also to give a shout out to your forthcoming book um, around coaching and flow. Can you tell us how we can find more information about all of that? <laughs> Sure, you can. Um, most everything is at our website, which is mindfulwarrior.com. And you can um, learn about our services there. And also, um, Cammie's the host of Mindful Warrior Radio, which you can find on um, any platform where you listen to podcasts. Anything else, Cammie, that you can think of? I think that said on Instagram, we are at the real mindful warrior. Um, and yes, please subscribe to Mindful Warrior Radio. That's some fun stuff. <laughs> it really <Agreed>. is. <laughs> yes, I, I agree too. <laughs> I, will, I will make sure those links and your website is in the show notes for listeners. And finally, to our listeners, thank you for sharing this sacred time with us. May you experience fulfillment on every level with great ease and joy. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening to the Unapologetic Heroine Podcast, featuring remarkable individuals living their truth. For more wisdom on how to support your own journey toward honoring your heart and courageously alchemizing our world through the power of love, pick up my book, The Way of Inanna, A Heroine's Guide to Living Unapologetically, at booksellers worldwide. <laughs>